Let's turn to the prophet Isaiah, to a text that is very familiar. Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. One called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. Then I said, Woe is me, for I am unruined, because I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs. He touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Whom shall I go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. The Canadian pastor theologian A.W. Tozier, whose writings have ministered to people all over the world, said it best in his now classic work, The Knowledge of the Holy. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. For whatever I think about God affects everything else about me. Everything. Identity, lifestyle, ethics, politics, relationships, money. Everything is shaped by how I answer the question, who is God and what is God like? Tozier followed the sentence I quoted with these arresting words. The history of humankind will probably show that no people has ever risen above its religion. And humanity's spiritual history will positively demonstrate that no religion has ever been greater than its ideas about God. For this reason, the gravest question before the church is always God himself. And the most portentous fact about any person is not what they at any given time may say or do, but what they in their deep heart conceive God to be. Holy, holy, holy. According to the prophet Isaiah, those who attend the very presence of the living God never stop singing. Holy, holy, holy. Kadosh, 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 sanctus, 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 heilige, 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 shen, 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 holy, holy, holy. In the year that King Uzziah died, Uzziah was one of the better kings of Israel. His death, as the death of most world leaders do, precipitated a period of much confusion. From the merely human perspective, life was coming apart. But that was not the case. It is actually never the case. For Isaiah makes the bold claim, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne. The Lord sitting on a throne. Earthly kings and queens rise and fall, but not the king of kings. Uzziah dies, but not the Lord. Uzziah dies, but not the living God. Uzziah dies, but not Yahweh. There is a throne of the universe, and someone is sitting on it. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. In that encounter that day, Isaiah is brought face to face with the very essence of the living God. Holy, holy, holy. The angelic choir sings the word three times, hinting at the threefoldness of the living God. Holy, 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 God in three persons, blessed Trinity. Holy. Reformed theologian R.C. Sproul is fond of pointing out that the angelic choir did not sing love, 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 
although they could have. The choir did not sing mercy, 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 although they could have. Nor did they sing truth, 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 or wisdom, wisdom, wisdom. Thankfully, they did not sing wrath, 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 anger, anger, anger. They sing, and they never tire doing so, holy, holy, holy. For holy is what God essentially is. Holy is what makes God be God. Holiness is not just another attribute of God, along with wisdom, power, justice, and mercy. God does not have holiness. God is holy. And it is this unholiness that undoes Isaiah. Why? For he knows he is not. The prophet knows that he is not holy, and he knows that holiness is what the holy God wants for us. You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. It is said in both Testaments, the new and the old. Yes, it is a command, you shall be holy, but it turns out to also primarily be a promise. You shall be holy. Why? For I, Yahweh, your God, am holy. God is saying, when you enter into a relationship with me, you become like me. We were made by the living God in the image and likeness of God, which means that we become all we were meant to be when we are like God, holy. Now, what does that mean, holy? There are at least three levels of meaning to the word. One is separate. The noun is related to the verb, which means to separate, to divide, to cut. So something is made holy by being separated, by being set apart. This is what we are in relationship with the Holy One. We've been set apart by God for God. The second level of meaning follows on the first, holy other, holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, holy other, unlike like nothing else, nothing else like it. Holiness is the majestic otherness of the living God. In, in the rest of Isaiah, we'll hear God ask again and again, to whom will you liken me? Who is my equal? Answer, to no one. There is no equal, holy. Holy other than everything else that is. So the third level of meaning, pure. To be holy is to be pure radiantly pure, holy, pure, sinless, no defect of any kind, utterly clean, beautifully clean, holy, 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 separate, 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 other than, other than, other than, pure, 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 clean, clean, clean. No wonder Isaiah cries out, woe to me, for I am ruined. No wonder he trembles to the bone. He, a mere man, is in the presence of holy himself. It's what the prophet Habakkuk also felt. I heard and my inward parts trembled at the sound. My lips quivered. Decay enters my bone, and in my place I tremble. I mean, how could it be otherwise? In the presence of holiness, I cannot but realize how unholy I am. In the presence of such majesty, I cannot be but realize how small I am. In the presence of such purity, I cannot but feel the depth of my own impurity. Yet you notice that Isaiah does not run from the presence. He wants to stay. As unsettling as it is, why? Well, for one thing, where else is he going to go? <laughs> where is the Holy One not present? But for another... The holy God is irresistible. Holiness is inherently attractive, which is why people flocked to Jesus. Holy is another way of saying perfectly whole. In the presence of perfect wholeness, we tremble. We, we do not run away, for whole is what we want to be. But how? How can we stay? Then one of the seraphim flew to me. The creature acted at the command of the holy God. The holy God ordered the seraphim to fly to Isaiah. 
He had a burning coal in his hand with which he, which he had taken out of the altar with tongs. And with it, he touched my mouth and said, behold, this has touched your lips and your iniquity is taken away and your sins are forgiven. Oh, mercy. <laughs> the Holy One so wants unholy ones to stay in his presence that he does something about our unholiness. Something had to be done for Isaiah in order to stay there. But what? Isaiah realized he could do nothing to make himself holy. He could do nothing to make himself pure. But God could and did and made it possible for the finite to be in the presence of the infinite, for the sinful to be in the presence of the sinless, for the impure to be in the presence of purity. The fire of holiness does not burn up holy people. The fireness of holiness just burns up all the unholiness of unholy people so unholy people can stay. You can see then that God being holy and God being love are not in conflict. For the holy God so loves unholy humans that he does what only he can do to make it possible for us to stay in his presence. When God loves us, God is not denying his holiness. When God loves us, he's doing what we could never do. He touches the unholiness with his holiness and rejoices as he does it. And that is what is going on at the cross when Jesus, the Holy One, gives his life for an unholy world. 